Thank you. The next item of business is a member's business debate on motion 984 in the name of Liam Kerr on increasing awareness of the work of veterans charities in Scotland and this debate will be concluded without any questions being put. I can ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now and I call on Liam Kerr to open the debate. Mr Kerr please. Thank you Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm very proud to bring forward this member's debate today and I would like to thank all of those from across the chamber who added their support to the motion, allowing us to debate and highlight an extremely important issue and the solutions offered by various charities. I'd like to begin by welcoming all in the public gallery, particularly those from Horseback UK, and thank them for coming to listen to what I'm certain will be an informative and productive debate. Before we get to the challenges and solutions, tonight's debate does give us the opportunity to pay tribute to our armed forces and veterans community and recon recognise the immense contribution that service personnel have made to Scottish society, whether during service or afterwards. And my motion then seeks to highlight the considerable challenges faced by some veterans who may require help for physical and or mental health problems. And this is important. A YouGov survey for SAFA concluded in, conducted in October 2017 shows the extent of problems faced by veterans. 33% of former services personnel feel isolated or lonely due to mental or physical health issues. 34% felt overwhelmed by negative feelings and 27% admit to having suicidal thoughts after finishing military service. I also understand that only 60% of working age veterans are in work compared to 73% of the UK population. Now of course this is not to say that all veterans will experience this, but we must acknowledge these statistics and ensure that our veterans who require assistance receive the very best advice and support as they readjust. And that is where the vital work undertaken by veteran charities and organisations in Scotland comes in. And I wanted to take this opportunity to highlight some of the outstanding work that they do. Approximately 320 armed forces charities operate in Scotland, providing a wide variety of services, including, but not limited to, health and well-being services, education, employment and career services, advice and advocacy services and housing provision. The scale and nature of these charities differs massively. There are the large nationally recognised organisations such as Poppy Scotland and the Royal British Legion Scotland. Poppy Scotland will no doubt want me to flag that they've launched the largest campaign ever outside the annual Poppy Appeal to inspire groups, schools, businesses, clubs and organisations around the country to raise £1,918 or more this year. But there are smaller but no less valuable organisations also playing a vital role, helping with the complex transition back onto Civvy Street, ensuring, in the words of Wings for Warriors, who work with wounded and medically discharged ex-service personnel to provide them with skills to be professional pilots, that veterans return to their communities as professionals to look up to, not to look after. Another who I am very pleased to have represented here today is Horseback UK. Co-founded by ex-Marine Jock Hutchinson, whose work was recently highlighted by the Prime Minister, no less, uses horsemanship to inspire recovery, regain self-esteem and provide a sense of purpose and community to the wounded, injured and sick of the military community. Learning to work with a horse is one of the most intricate and challenging things that anyone can do. And the courses and voluntary programmes at Horseback UK give participants a place where they can learn new skills whilst overcoming any physical limitations and by taking a holistic approach, aid mental and social recovery. The impact that this charity has had on the lives of those they supported has been extraordinary. Talking of his own experience, a Royal Marines Corporal said that the charity had started an important new chapter in his life and had shown him that there was still hope. The spouse of another stated, the effects have lasted longer than I expected them to. We had a few moments before he left when he would normally have gone into the darkness. But much to my surprise and delight, he was very chilled and relaxed. You can hear more at the reception I'm holding right after this in the Burns Room at CR1. That is why debates like these are so important. It gives us the opportunity to highlight those organisations that are going <coughs> above and beyond, but also to highlight what actually is out there. During the Veterans and Armed Forces community debate in November, Richard Lockhead rightly highlighted the difficulties that some Armed Forces personnel may have in understanding what each of these organisations delivered. And so I wanted to highlight and welcome the work of the Veterans Gateway. 
Veterans Gateway, many of whose team are veterans themselves, is the first point of contact to put veterans and their families in touch with the organisation's best place to help with the information, advice and support they need, from health care and housing to employability, finances, personal relationships and more. But additionally, we as representatives have an important part to, par to play. I'm pleased to see both the Scottish Government and the UK Government proactively seeking to address this. In particular, I'd like to welcome the UK Government's plans to introduce different driving licences for veterans. This is a scheme which could be implemented by the early 2020s and will be the first universally recognised ID for veterans in the UK, creating a new proof of service for veterans and ensuring that they have access to healthcare benefits, amongst other things. And this is important because I think those who serve our country deserve recognition, and this should help. On which note, I'd like to highlight the Royal British Legion and Poppy Scotland's Count Them In campaign. Despite an estimated one in 10 of the UK population being members of the armed forces community, there is limited information about wh where they are or what their needs might be. So by adding new questions to the 2021 census, we should be able to improve our understanding of this unique community and ensure that the needs of our forces personnel, veterans and their families are fully met. Deputy Presiding Officer, I would like to urge the Scottish Government to continue to look at ways in which we can highlight and support veterans, charities and groups, particularly those smaller ones like Horseback UK. Yes, of course. Christina McKelvey. Thank you very much, President Officer. Thank you, uh, Liam Kerr, and thanks for bringing this, uh, the debate, because in my constituency, it's something that's very close to my heart and the veterans that I work with. Would he join with me and encourage your colleagues in the Chamber to look at the ASAP project, which was, it was piloted in Hamilton and rolled out to the rest of Scotland, and for local members to make connections with their local ASAP project, which is a project between Poppy Scotland and Citizens Advice Scotland, in order to ensure that you know that you're signposting the veterans that you work with to the right people? All right, we get additional time, Mr Kerr. Liam Kerr. Oh, that's fine. I think it's a, a very important point. I thank the member for the intervention, and uh, the answer is yes. Uh, so, because without organisations such as that, without organisations such as Horseback UK, the cost and impact on our local services and local authorities could be great, and the, the negative impact on the veterans even greater. And the positives which arise to society, individuals and the economy, as a result of this work are considerable. So I, I genuinely thank the members who are in the chamber this evening for coming together to discuss this important matter. Uh, and I really hope that some of you will be able to join me at the event I'm sponsoring with Horseback UK in the Burns Room after this debate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Kerr. Call Claire Hockey to follow by Edward Mountain. Ms Hockey, please. Thank you, President Officer, and I'd like to thank Liam Kerr for bringing uh, this important motion for debate to highlight the work that veterans organisations do. Only yesterday we celebrated 100 years since the Representation of the People Act, which gave many women the right to vote for the first time. According to a tweet by Poppy Scotland yesterday, one of the main reasons that this was made possible and supported by the public and some of the establishment was due to the contribution women made to society during the First World War. The First World War will also be commemorating a 100-year anniversary in November this year, and it changed the UK forever and the effect it had on those who served and their families is immeasurable. Over six million men served in the war. Three quarters of a million never returned home, including my great-grandmother's brother, who died at the Battle of the Somme. 1.75 million suffered some kind of disability and millions more couldn't find work on their return from the front. To care for those who suffered, whether through their own service or through that of a family member, the British Legion, as they were then known, was formed to support them. And to this day, Scotland still has a large and vibrant armed forces community, including reservists, regular personnel and their families, with estimates showing the community encompasses over half a million people. In a previous members' debate, I spoke about the many veterans who've been supported and cared for at Erskine Hospital and the dedication of the staff there who have worked there for the past 101 years. The impact and effect war continues to have on our forces and their families is substantial. Therefore, the support from our veterans' charities and organisations is still as crucial today as ever. One of my Blantyre constituents, David, has had support from both the British Legion and the National Gulf Veterans and Families Association. David served in the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards and was stationed in Germany prior to the First Gulf War. 
In late 1990, David received multiple injections all at the same time in preparation for possible deployment to the Gulf. As it turned out, he wasn't deployed, but has suffered from ill health since. David left the army in May 1992 and suffers from a combination of health issues, including impaired mobility, that he believes are directly attributable to those injections. The problem is that David and many other veterans have never found out the exact cocktail of vaccines that they were given, as the MOD says his medical records are missing and the army initially denied that any such injections took place. However, certain declassified documents indicate that these vaccines may have contained strains of anthrax and botulism. The lack of transparency by the MOD in this issue inhibits civilian doctors from giving an accurate diagnosis and treatment for the health issues such veterans continue to experience. More than anything, David simply wants an acknowledgement that the injections took place and the information on what he was injected with, as he believes this will inform his ongoing treatment. The National Gulf Veterans and Families Association has provided David with advice and support, but is limited in what it can do in this instance. It would be helpful to them and to the good work that they continue to do for David and hundreds of other veterans in Scotland if the MOD was less retentive about medical information it holds, and that would be helpful in improving veterans' quality of life. Since the First World War through to the Gulf War and beyond, successive governments have let down too many of our veterans and their families. Being thrust into a new civilian life or families left to deal with the loss of loved ones is too often too difficult for someone to deal with alone. We can dispute the merits of going to a particular war, dispute as to whether troops should be deployed or not, and dispute who our allies should be. However, what we cannot dispute is that our veterans' charities and organisations are very often left covering gaps in support which the government should be offering. Presiding officer, we all owe a great debt to our armed forces and their families who have sacrificed so much for us and to the veterans' charities and organisations that endeavour to support them. But it's the UK government who must step up and protect our men and women who go to war and protect us. Thank you. I call Edward Mountain, followed by Jackie Bailey. Mr Mountain, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to thank also uh, Liam Kerr for bringing this motion to the Parliament and for allowing us to debate this important subject. I suppose at the outset I ought to declare that I am officially a veteran, although I don't like to consider that as an entirely appropriate label. Why? Well, because the word veteran comes from a Latin word which means old, and I don't consider that I am old. I'm going to part that comment because my children continually tell me that I am old. Uh, and what I'd like to do is look at what veterans' charities achieve, and a particularly horseback UK. Presiding officer, I spent two years of my career in the services undertaking mounted ceremonial duties in London. Now, I have to confess that when I was posted to London to do this, I wasn't keen. In fact, I was sent screaming and kicking to Knightsbridge. When I started, I subscribed to the old adage about horses that they bite at one end and kick at the other. And I would have added at that stage that the bit in the middle tried very hard to ensure that you landed in the line of fire of the kicking bit or the biting bit. 24 weeks of riding school taught me something different. I joined a ride of young soldiers, most of whom had never touched a horse, let alone ridden one. Most lacked confidence in their abilities and questioned the wisdom of ever having joined a regiment that actually had to ride horses. Within a week of finishing our course, we all rode on the Queen's Birthday Parade, and let me tell you, that was quite an achievement for young soldiers. During those 24 weeks, we learned a lot about, uh, I learned, and we all learned a lot about horses, and I saw, saw young soldiers maturing and gaining a confidence in their ability that they never had before. Those that did particularly well were those that came to trust the horses and built an empathy with them, working together and trusting each other. This is what I understand Horseback UK is about, building confidence, self-esteem self and a bond of re resilience that is not questioned, just accepted. Let me be clear, horses are not stupid, but they do look to their human counterparts for a lead. They don't judge those human counterparts on their physical stature. They judge them on how they are treated. For servicemen, adults and children who lack confidence, 
Horses provide a vehicle to rebuild a faith in their inner being. Horses are also not solitary animals, and neither are humans. Both need a community, and I recognise the importance of a community within veterans. I served in much more peaceful times than many younger, recently discharged veterans have. However, I suspect that many soldiers have probably seen things they would rather not have done. And sometimes being with friends and colleagues who don't need to ask any questions in an unspoken understanding of what has gone on before is a very important kind of therapy. <coughs> Presiding officer, I'd like to finish by saying that there are many veterans charities and I wish them all well. I actually believe that these independent charities can do much more than government charities who are often bound by regulations. The independence of these charity give them the ability to invest as they see fit and make our veterans' charities the envy of the world. What we all need to do is to remember that to keep their independence, they need our help, and this we should give them freely. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. I call Jackie Bailey to be followed by Mike Rumbles. Ms Bailey, please. Can I thank Liam Kerr for bringing this debate to the Chamber and for highlighting the important work done by Horseback UK and veterans charities across Scotland. And I pay tribute, like others have, across the Chamber to the work of these charities and thank them for all that they do. As you all know, the majority of my involvement with the armed forces stems from um, Her Majesty's Naval Base Clyde at Faz Lane in my own constituency. There are a significant number of both serving men, women and veterans who live in my constituency with their families. And I know how incredibly important it is for them to be supported throughout their careers and indeed when they retire. As Liam Kerr's motion highlights, there is a stigma surrounding seeking help for physical or mental health problems in the veterans community. And the support of charities like the ones I will mention allow veterans to live a full and independent life after leaving the forces. Let me start by talking about a charity we all know well, which is SAFA, the Soldiers, Sailors, Airmen and Families Association. They aim to ensure that the needs of our armed forces and our veterans are met, and they have independence and dignity after they leave the service. Now, I know they provide a range of very valuable support, both for a person's physical needs and mental well-being, um, and it's hugely practical support for veterans and their families. Um, they work throughout the UK, and I am blessed to have them operating in my area. At this point, I would want to give a huge shout out to Mary Birch, because she's the divisional secretary of my local SAFA, and aside from being enormously helpful and sympathetic, she is tireless in her fundraising, in support of organisations like Erskine um, and the Skylark Trust. But I have referred constituents to SAFA when they're struggling to receive help elsewhere. And let me tell you about a veteran's widow who was struggling to get in and out of the bath. She needed adaptations to her bathroom. The council was unable and indeed unwilling to help, but SAFA stepped in. They funded adaptations to her bathroom to allow a shower to be fitted. That let her maintain her independence and continue living in her own home. That's a very real example of the service that charities like SAFA provide for armed forces families. That kind of practical, lifelong support, not only for the veterans themselves, but for their families too, is just so helpful. Another prominent veterans charity in my constituency is the Armed Forces Veterans Association. Their office is unusually based at Dumbarton Central train station. And given the infrequency of the trains, you can spend some very useful time in there um, because they have also developed a museum of military artefacts as well. So I would encourage colleagues to visit. But they provide information and advice for military veterans and a counselling service is also available. They're open every weekday for people just to pop in, have a chat, have a cup of tea, um, and they're supported by volunteers who can continue to be part of the forces community after they finish their service. And I have first-hand experience of just how important their service is in helping veterans, perhaps dealing with PTSD, to access health and housing provision, and have worked with them to help veterans in very practical ways. So the work done by veterans charities in my constituency, right the way across the UK, is invaluable. And it is right that veterans who have served their country deserve our thanks, our recognition, and our support. 
but there is still more to be, do, to, to be done. And we must ensure that veterans get access to the right support at the right time. And I would encourage all members in the chamber to find out information about their veterans' charities in their local area, because as MSPs, we can play an important role in raising awareness of veterans' charities in our patch and right the way across Scotland to ensure that everybody does, in fact, receive the support that they need and deserve. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I call Mike Rumbles, to be followed by Graham D. Please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I, like others, would like to thank <coughs> Liam Kerr for bringing this motion forward for debate tonight. <coughs> and before I go any further, I should say that I'm a veteran myself, having served some 15 years in the Army, both at home and abroad, with another 17 years reserve liability. So uh, although I, I left the Army back in 1994, before the term veteran became the accepted terminology for ex-service personnel, and so I suppose I have the same feelings as Edward Mountain has about the term veteran. Uh, it's really important to increase the awareness of the work of so many veteran charities across Scotland. They do a really good job, and in a moment I want to highlight the work of Age Scotland's veteran project, particularly in the Northeast. However, before I do that, I need to say how disappointed I am to see the withdrawal of the Veteran First Point Service in Grampian, which occurred last year. The Veteran First Point Service closed simply because even with Scottish Government offering to meet 50% of the funding, Grampian NHS couldn't find the cash to enable the specialist service to continue. Now, I've repeatedly raised the fact that Grampian NHS has been consistently underfunded over many years, and certainly over the last nine years, by some £165 million, and the board believed that they had no option but to decline funding for this important veteran service. But tonight, I don't want to focus on the negative, as I want to be positive about this issue, and I know that Age Scotland has stepped into the breach with help. They are active in the North East with the Community Development Officer, and their aim is to ensure that these veterans aged over 65 get the help they need uh, when they need it. I want to emphasize that it doesn't matter how long ago an individual served their country or for what period they served. You can get help and advice from the Age Scotland Veteran Project. Their helpline is now a gateway to a range of veteran support organizations and projects. And if they can't help an individual or family themselves, they make sure someone else does help. Now, I know time is short this evening, Deputy Presiding Officer, especially after we extended decision time, so I'll end my contribution to this debate by saying once again congratulations to Liam Kerr for securing the debate. The debates like this are important and I, I do hope that the Age Scotland's veteran project continues to be a success, especially for those veterans in my patch in the northeast who need the help and advice provided for, by them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rumbles. I call Graham Day to be followed by Maurice Corrie. Mr. Day, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, can I firstly thank Liam Kerr for lodging this motion, particularly where it focuses on Horseback UK, a charity which is undertaking excellent work supporting our service personnel and veterans. It's an organisation I know something of, certainly the fundraising aspect of, even although it isn't actually based in my constituency. Not long after uh, being elected to Holyrood, I was asked to officiate uh, in a cycle ride around our broth uh, that was being held to raise funds for Horseback UK. There I met Jock Hutchison, the CEO and co-founder, for the first time. Now, Jock tends to leave a bit of an impression on folk when they meet him, but my abiding memory that day wasn't Jock with his cowboy hat and larger-than-life persona, but chatting to some of the severely wounded veterans who'd benefited from the charity's work. It was a genuinely heartwarming experience. The invitation to welcome the cyclists across the finishing line came from Ian Wren, who was a volunteer fundraiser at the time. Ian has since taken retirement from his work and assumed the role of Horseback's fundraising manager. He's a constituent of mine, and along with his wife, Bev, is a well-kent face at community events where he flies the flag for the charity, and he's something of a force of nature. Ian's also one of my Facebook friends, and it would be fair to say he posts as regularly about his fundraising activity as Murdo Fraser takes to Twitter on the wind-up. But just as charities and causes need something that sets them apart from the crowd, so to be successful they need committed fundraisers like Ian. I pay tribute to him for all that he does on behalf of Horseback UK. And there's another Angus South connection with Horseback UK. Jock Hutchison previously served at RM Condor in our broad, a base that I know is close to the heart of the Cabinet Secretary. 
In 2008, when the idea for horseback uh, came about, it was a particularly traumatic year for 4-5 uh, Commando, as in a recently completed tour of Afghanistan, they lost nine of their own in combat, with a further 16 uh, Marines suffering life-changing injuries. Jock and Emma Hutchison offered the farm at a boyne somewhere that the injured Marines could visit for a break away from clinical recovery. And over the following 12 months, several groups took advantage of their hospitality. Now, whilst horseback's work has spread much further than the northeast of Scotland, as a constituency MSP for Condor, I want to highlight some of the support that the organisation has provided to those who've served with 4 5 Commando. Lance Corporal Jason Hare, who is now the organisation's operations manager, was previously based in Arbro. Jason served for 14 years, including undertaking three tours of Afghanistan. In 2008, he was severely injured whilst on patrol in Helmand after triggering a landmine. Following extended treatment, he returned to his unit to continue his rehab and transition into civvy life. And it was whilst there in 2010, he became aware of Horseback UK and, the, and joined colleagues on a visit. He believes the activities that Horseback UK give participants uh, provide not only an insight into horsemanship and rural activity, but also potential careers as they brace themselves to transition back into civvy life. And he describes this organisation as having given him and many others, and I quote, a renewed spark and enthusiasm for life. Another RM Condor beneficiary of Horseback UK, Corporal Matthew Turnbull, this, uh, says of it that it shows there is still hope in life. He notes that the charity's work is valued not just by him, but also his family. And that's an aspect of Horseback's uh, impact that we should not forget. As the recovery of injured personnel progresses, so too can the stress and emotional toll carried by wider family ease. Presiding officer, there can be no praise high enough for the work this charity does, the positive benefit it brings to the lives of injured service personnel. And I'm pleased to have had the opportunity tonight to join others in recognising that. Presiding officer. Thank you very much, Mr Day. I call Maurice Corrie to be followed by Tom Arthur. And Tom Arthur will be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr Corrie, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, also, thank you for letting me speak in this debate this evening. I, I thank Liam Kerr for bringing this very important debate, debate tonight to the Chamber, and I always welcome the opportunity to speak on veterans' issues in this Parliament. Additionally, I would like to take the opportunity to thank Horseback UK for the work uh, that they do for, with our wonderful veterans. Uh, Liam Kerr gave a great description of the work and the benefits it brings to veterans in areas such as building up their confidence and self-belief. But I'd also like to draw attention to what Claire Hockey was saying. I'm very, very interested indeed what she said in relation to our service personnel who were involved in Gulf War I and the question of the vaccinations. This is something that's very much on my mind at the moment, and we're hearing more about it. But I fully support the points you make, and I'd very like to discuss with you sometime as chairman of the cross-party group uh, as where we might take this forward. And no doubt the minister will probably address this issue later on. Um, it is a very big problem, and, and we need to get to the bottom of it. Um, as Liam's motions, as Liam Kerr's motions notes, that the veterans' charities are important. They can be difficult area, a difficult area to work in. He also pointed out there are at least 320 groups in Scotland who deal with this. Now, some of the groups deal with over 200 cases a month uh, in dealing with veterans in lieu, in lieu of support from local authorities. And I've had conversations with several of these charities, and they tell me they struggle from month to month with finance to provide this support. Now, it's important that we support them as they provide a high level of individualised care that could be replicated by the public sector but it is delivered by them and is so desperately needed for our veterans. Now in conclusion uh, Deputy Viney Officer on the 16th of November last year I called on the Scottish Government to see what could be done to provide financial support uh, to these charities who deal with these, uh, these costs and I hope that he will be able tonight the Cabinet Secretary to update this chamber on, uh, on what the progress has been made in relation to my request in November last year and what we've made so far. Thank you. Thank you. I call Tom Arthur. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I would like to begin by joining colleagues in thanking Liam Kerr for securing this debate this evening. I would also like to join colleagues in paying tribute and recognising the tremendous contribution that our forces community has made, both in service and as uh, veterans. And I have to confess that I had only first come across Horseback UK, I believe it was in the debate we had in November, um, when uh, Liam uh, Kerr mentioned it. I believe he uh, began to tell us an anecdote and kept us in suspense, which I think we're still waiting to later. Unfortunately, I'm unable to make it along to the reception this evening, but I, I wish him all the best for it. Um, I'm really struck by some of the uh, comments that have been made. I think uh, it was Edward Mountain who 
uh, spoke of um, horse craft and engaging with the animal, being able to rebuild faith and inner being. And I think that's a, a very powerful way, certainly, to describe it. Um, and I think there's um, a colleague mentioned earlier of uh, forces when the return has been professions to look up to, not to look after. And there's something about reading and learning about the work of Horseback UK, which is a, a work that seems absolutely incredible and, and incredibly empowering as well. And one of the particular uh, aspects of, of their work which I'm struck by is that veterans who come along to use the service can end up engaging and working with Horseback UK. And it's tremendous to see that um, the empowering nature of, that, um, of these opportunities that are provided. Um, but particularly um, telling for me was that the services that I understand are now providing to the wider community. Um, I think particularly it was on their website it described as um, children who are perhaps socially or academically marginalised. I think this speaks to the tremendous contribution that our veterans and forces community makes more widely um, across Scotland and in various communities. Um, and certainly as, a, as an MSP in Renfrewshire, um, we obviously have Erskine nearby, which has been mentioned already, and also the newly opened Scott um, Warblinded Centre at Hawkhead. Erskine has, um, I think, it's a tremendous feature for people's lives right across the west of Scotland, and they have fantastic links with the local community. I certainly um, recall as um, someone who was musically engaged throughout high school every Christmas, having the opportunity to go out and perform for vet uh, veterans. Um, in Erskine, which was a great honour and a great privilege that many students um, sought. And I think it speaks to the great partnership um, between um, veterans' charities and the wider communities in the areas that they serve. Um, I certainly um, would also want to commend um, Erskine on their recently published strategy, which, um, while recognising some of the challenges that are faced, um, is very ambitious in adapting to the needs and demands of the veterans community moving forward. I'd also just want to recognise the um, fantastic um, Scottish War Blinded Centre opened at Hawkhead. This is in my colleague um, George Adams' uh, constituency of Paisley. Um, this is a really a fantastic centre. Um, it's providing advice and specialist advice and the use, and use of specialist equipment and financial support um, and helping people to increase their confidence and in independent living. Um, and I now have over 30 staff, some of whom are from my own constituency of Renfrewshire South, and having spoken with them, I know how much they value um, the, the opportunity and chance to work there and recognise tremendous work um, that goes on at the Hawkhead Centre. So I'd just like to again um, thank Liam Kerr for bringing this um, important debate to the Parliament. And I'd also say it's great to be debating this in February, and I hope we have more opportunities, not just around Remembrance Sunday, to be recognising the fantastic contribution that both our veterans charities and our veterans community makes to Scotland. Thank you. Thank you. I call on Pete Brown to close with the Government Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and thank you also to Liam Kerr for uh, bringing forward this worthwhile and interesting debate. Uh, I, for my part, and the Scottish Government's part, are always very keen to increase awareness and champion the valuable work that veterans charities do throughout Scotland, and Liam Kerr's efforts are doing precisely that, as well as the reception, which I'll mention again just for advertising purposes, which takes place immediately after this debate. I think it's true to say, President Officer, that the third sector in Scotland is both strong and dynamic, and it plays a crucial role in the well-being of our communities. And we are very fortunate to have a good mix of people and organisations within the veterans community here in Scotland who are making a real difference. We do, and I'm told this by people very active out with Scotland, have the real advantage of scale. A very close-knit sector, a fact noted by Forces in Mind Trust in their Armed Forces Charity Sector in Scotland report in 2016. And I continue to be grateful to all of the charities, a number of whom have been mentioned tonight, organisations like Veterans Scotland, Poppy Scotland, Legion Scotland, Erskine, Scottish Veterans Residences, one of which is just across from this Parliament, uh, Combat Stress, and many others who work very hard to bring everyone together and to make sure that support is there for those who need it most. If I can just pick up on one or two of the points made uh, by members. First of all, Graham Day's point about the impact and the offer that was made by Horseback UK to the Marines that he spoke about that had come back from Afghanistan with what is called quite chillingly life-changing uh, injuries. Uh, in my experience, uh, having visited Horseback UK, it, it really is the case that sometimes Horseback UK is able to reach um, out to those veterans in a way that other charities, other organisations have not been able to do. And actually, it's something very um, 
odd, in a way, something very surprising when you visit Horseback UK to find that relationship uh, in terms of dealing with a horse. The, the, the way it can change people is, is quite extraordinary. It was something which I have to confess I wasn't aware of before visiting Horseback UK. Um, I think it, also just to mention one or two other points made by members, Jackie Bailey mentioned the Dumbarton train station veteran centre, which I have visited and I can tell you the train service was excellent that day, um, <laughs> as was the coffee and the reception from the veterans uh, that were there. Uh, I think the very substantive point by, made by um, Claire Hawhey is, is very important and uh, I'm glad that Maurice Corrie's picked up on this as well. Not so much the issue, which is very important in its own right, about the cocktail of uh, drugs which were given to veterans um, or service personnel going to uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. But about the point that Claire Hockey made about the MOD being very retentive on health records, I have made this point repeatedly to UK ministers. If they can facilitate the passing on of complete health records from somebody's service period to a GP or the health service, then it can make so much difference for exactly the reasons that Claire Hockey mentioned, that uh, physicians can take a much more balanced and rounded and informed approach if they're aware of the history uh, of somebody's uh, medical history during their, their time in service. Uh, yes, I will. Christina McKelvey. Very much. Thank you very much, President Officer, and thanks, Cabinet Secretary, for taking the intervention. See, on the point of medical records and Claire Hockey's point about veterans needing that support, will the Cabinet Secretary join with me and will not be surprised about me raising this in this debate that it, for once and for all, the UK Government should take responsibility for the men who were used in nuclear testing sites in Christmas Island and give them their medical records and give them their compensation? Cabinet Secretary. Well, it's a point the member has raised before, and of course she's met with those veterans, as I have done. And I think the same point applies. Anybody who has served in the forces surely has a right to have their medical records uh, available to them, of course, as we have the right to do as civilians. But also, much more importantly sometimes, is that the people that are looking after them in a medical sense also have access to those records. I think it's a relatively uncontentious point, and progress has been made south of the border. The latest excuse I got when raising it with the UK Minister was to do with the different uh, computer systems, IT systems in Scotland. That's not sufficient. We should be moving on this uh, much more quickly. Actually, as uh, Christina McKelvey has intervened, her intervention in relation to uh, ASAP, again, a, a tremendous charity, but a very different impact from, say, Horseback UK, in particular veterans who want to try and access and are perfectly entitled to a series of benefits they're not aware of, have been absolutely transformed in their situations by the, the advice given by ASAP. And I'm lucky in my constituency, or just outside it rather, to have the benefits of an ASAP office co-located with Citizens Advice and one particular individual who has changed the lives of many veterans. So uh, extremely important we mention those. Uh, and also the last point, I think Mike Rumble's point, uh, uh, his point, which he's raised before, um, about the health service. All I would say is, and I, I made this point in a recent meeting with Maurice Corrie, the Scottish Government gets not one single penny to fund anything that we do for veterans in Scotland. We don't receive anything in terms of the block, block grant. So we want to spend money on veterans because we think it's important. So whether it's the millions that went to combat stress, the millions which have gone in terms of providing housing, not least in Cranhill and Glasgow, whether it's the Veterans Fund, which I'll mention shortly, we spend this money because we think veterans are a priority. I do think there's a role for the UK government, not just in relation to Scotland and in relation to Scotland, sorry, Wales and Northern Ireland, to say we have taken on these people in the first place. We have an enduring responsibility and that should be recognised in the block grant. And we could do so much more if that was possible. Yes, yes, I will. Have time, yeah. Mike Rumbles. I hope the Minister recognises that I did give him, uh, did make the point that the Scottish Government offered a 50% uh, cash payment to the, to the health board as well as the health board just wouldn't take it up. And I don't doubt uh, his personal commitment to veterans in Scotland, but I just wanted to make that clear that I did actually say that and, and, and acknowledge that. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, I do acknowledge that, but the point that I'm trying to make is, in relation to things that we want to do specifically for veterans, and of course veterans' first point had an element of that, not least in the peer-to-peer -peer support that was available beyond the health services, we have to find this money from other budgets, from education and other budgets, and I just think that there's a, a case to be made there for saying the UK Government, given the, where the service has been rendered, I have a responsibility here. Um, Horseback UK has been mentioned, as I say, I have visited there some years ago now. I had the privilege of visiting in 2012 to see the work they do. And after traumatic injuries, service personnel and veterans can feel isolated. Their confidence can be affected. Uh, Horseback UK have helped over 1,000 individuals over the last decade. 
uh, and recognising, of course, that recovery is very often more than a clinical process and that need, people need uh, help regaining self-belief after injury. And we heard from Ed Edward Mountain how horses can actually provide uh, that route back to increased self-belief. Uh, and they also empower the injured to help others, uh, Horseback UK, by creating a purpose and, and a community uh, for recovery. Uh, the Scottish Government, for our part, has been able to directly support Horseback UK and other charities and organisations that help veterans and their families through the Scottish Veterans Fund. And through that fund, we've invested in over 140 projects in areas like housing, healthcare and other services. Over £1 million has been awarded through the fund to organisations working in support of the veterans community and ex services charities since its creation in 2008. Uh, and I have to say, the reason, one of the reasons we created uh, the Veterans Fund was because there was a report done by the House of Commons Health Committee, I think in 2007, which was pretty damning of the provision for veterans in Scotland, not least through the health service. And that's one reason why we've sought to uh, improve uh, matters there. Uh, the panel met last week to review applications made to the Scottish Veterans Fund for the 2018 round of applications. Funding awarded will be announced in the coming weeks. And I have to say, unlike previous years, uh, apart from last year, I'm no longer the person responsible for uh, proposing which funds should benefit from that. That's done now by the Veterans Commissioner and others. Uh, more broadly, just quickly in relation to health, the government continues to be committed to ensuring that all armed forces personnel and veterans living in Scotland have access to the best possible care and support, including safe, effective and patient-centred health care. We're also fortunate, I think, to have outstanding public and third sector organisations that look after our veterans uh, and very often, as Jackie Bailey rightly said, in relation to families, uh, the families of veterans. For example, a network of champions for armed forces and veterans are there to support armed forces personnel, uh, veterans and their families to get access to the high quality services and treatment when they are required. Uh, this is arguably, and I make this point unashamedly, more effective here in Scotland than elsewhere in the UK. That is something I'm fed back from those organisations which are active across the UK. They're very complementary of uh, things which we're doing, uh, although always acknowledging there's more we can do. Uh, and the Scottish Veterans Commissioner is also looking at veterans' health and wellbeing. His interim report, Veterans' Health and Wellbeing in Scotland, Are We Getting It Right? It was published last year and positively concluded that veterans are not experiencing disadvantage in health and social care provision in Scotland. Now, that might seem odd language, but the reason that we do that is there is a consensus within in the veterans community, it seems to me that what governments and other agencies should try and do is make sure there's no disadvantage rather than provide an advantage. We do do that in some circumstances, not least in relation to um, uh, prosthetics and other uh, very expensive items. We make sure there's an advantage to veterans, and I think that's right. But by and large, what we try and do is make sure there's no disadvantage. Why should you be disadvantaged just because you've served in the armed forces? Uh, so I look forward to the Commissioner's next report, which is due to be published in the spring. The report will look at the physical and mental health of veterans in Scotland and improving health outcomes for all veterans and families. And we will carefully consider his recommendations. Uh, mental health continues rightly to be an area of key focus for the veterans community. And I think we all have a responsibility to help realise the vision that we have of a Scotland where people can get the right help at the right time. And of course, I'm well aware the government has a very special uh, responsibility in that regard. Uh, and also, to people should be able to expect recovery and to fully enjoy their rights, free from discrimination and stigma. An increased investment to support delivery of our na national mental health strategy will help to drive that improvement. And we should also recognise the priority we attach to that. Um, I mentioned we've supported combat stress in partnership with NHS Scotland to deliver specialist and community-based mental health services to veterans in Scotland. In total, over £8.5 million has been provided since 2012. And the vast majority, I think this was the point that was made early on in the debate, and I forget uh, who it was uh, that made it. Uh, apologies for that. The vast majority of our armed forces personnel transition to be real contributors to our society. It's one of the areas I actually uh, most frequently agree with Tobias Elwood, who's one of the MOD ministers. The vast majority of veterans transition to society without any issue. For many, the very fact of having to take responsibility for their health, for housing, for a job, is the scariest thing they will ever have done. And that can provide real challenges. And they need to have support from us in terms of mental health or physical challenges. Our armed forces and veterans charitable sector, which Horseback UK is a vital part of, offer a strong and effective network of help. And I'd like to reiterate, finally, my appreciation and commitment to continue to work closely with all of our partner charities and organisations to further support for our veterans community moving forward. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, thank you. That concludes the debate, and I close this meeting.